Well, hey there, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of the Dark Parade. And not just a new episode, it's a whole new month. We've got uh, a, a new uh, set of movies to talk about in this month. Um, I, I am a fan of uh, abject punnery. And so <laughs> this month, I am deeming Juniversal. And here it is, Juniversal first. If, uh, if you're listening to this on the regular feed, if you're listening to the Legion Podcast Patreon, you're getting it a little early. Um, so go to patreon.com forward slash Legion Podcast if you want to hear these episodes uh, a couple of days ahead of time. Uh, and, and just to help support the cause, right? Like uh, the server and all that stuff. But anyway, I'm not here to pimp the Legion Podcast Patreon. I mean, I'm always kind of low-key uh, pimping that, but... No, no, no. I want to uh, pitch you all on the idea of, hey, we're going to do five weeks worth of universal horror. And yeah, we're going to cover some of the big monsters, obviously. But uh, I, I know a lot of people have this knee-jerk reaction when you talk about the universal movies. And it's like, yeah, they're kind of quaint and they're kind of charming, I suppose. But they're not really horror movies, not in the real sense of the word, not today. And I will uh, counter with the set of movies we're going to talk about this month that they are all to one degree or another, not just formative, not just classic movies, but great movies on their own. And now I'm not going to be able to overcome some crazy phobia people have about, you know, black and white movies or, oh, I just can't watch an actor before, you know, Brando invented method acting if that's your thing my heart goes out to you you're missing out on some, some great cinema but i'm not going to convince you that you know the universal movies from the 30s and 40s are uh are, are going to be you know modern in their in their uh feel yeah that's always a thing that kind of strikes me as strange that, hey, this movie looks different from the movies that come out today, therefore, I discount them. Um, and I, I think that's a real uh, a real misbegotten idea. Uh, if you are one of those people, I don't think it makes you a bad person. Like I said, it, it, it engenders sympathy in me more than anything because you can't enjoy, you know, It's a Wonderful Life and you can't enjoy The Wolfman and... Uh, a bunch of the other movies that we're going to be talking about, uh, which is a shame, uh, th because they're great movies. Um, and Casablanca and, and Citizen Kane, like you can't watch some of the classics of cinema, uh, the Maltese Falcon. I mean, just uh, the, the list goes on and on of, of movies that you're just the M, the silent film M. If you can't enjoy, you know, a silent movie, you're, you're, you don't get that. You don't get the cabinet of Dr. Caligari and... Uh, boy, what just what a small world it creates where you can only watch movies made after like 1958, um, <laughs> when there's decades of movies before that, some of which are fantastic. You can't watch Psycho. You can't watch Psycho. How can you not watch Psycho? Uh, anyway, I'm I'm inventing. This is a straw man argument. I'm just inventing this person that can't watch black and white movies, and I'm raking them over the coals. If you're one of those people. Uh, then, then reach out to me, explain yourself. And on the back end of this, you can hear all about how you can get in touch with me. But, uh, for now, let's focus on what's uh, immediately ahead of us, which is the, the beginning of our Juniversal celebration. I'm very excited about this. I hope you stick around for these conversations because they are not just, Hey, are, aren't the original Universal monsters great? You know, obviously, like we do on this show, we're going to dig into the themes a little bit. Uh, these movies are so rich in history uh, in terms of how these movies got made and, and sort of the behind the scenes stuff. They're, the story of Lon Chaney Jr. As, a, as an individual, not just as an actor, but just as a human being, is something that we go through on this episode. And it's fascinating and, and like how his personal life related to the role that he was playing. Um, in, in this film. And, and then, you know, Court and I, obviously, we get into a lot about the themes of this movie, uh, which, you know, slight spoilers, this is all about the darkness that we all hold within us uh, to some degree, and get into werewolf mythology and how much this movie invented so much of that, and 
Uh, it's just, it's a wonderful conversation. I'm going to shut up about it. Here's me in court psyops talking about Universal's The Wolfman. Uh, hey everyone, welcome to this conversation with uh, me and Court Psyops, a returning champion, Court Psyops. <laughs> the guy that keeps bugging you the most, like, hey, Bo, what else you got? We got to uh, chat. What else you got? <laughs> let me tell you. Uh, I'll have to look at the spreadsheet. It's all on a spreadsheet, everybody. It's all <laughs> it, like my need for organization is such that there is a spreadsheet with movies through August and and host assigned to eh, at least some of them um there's a <laughs> there there is a, a an honest chance that one of these movies this very month i might just do solo because everybody's like i'm not sure i want to do that and i'm like well screw you guys i i do want to do it um, oh well if you need someone hit me up because i will talk universal regardless of the month anytime yeah, so as, as you noted there, Cord, this is part of our Universal celebration. And don't kid yourself if you don't think that next year we're going to call this Son of Universal. <laughs> oh, I was hoping for a daughter of we could be a little more it's, woke. You know, it's going to, you got to let it breathe. There's going to be uh, the castle of Universal, uh, Universal's daughter. It, like you, it, the whole pantheon. House of Universal. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> House of Long Universals. Um, <laughs> but I, I wanted to kind of kick things off with this movie, which is 1941's The Wolfman. Um, actually, The Wolfman. It is two distinct words. Uh, unlike the remake, which was just just Wolfman. And The Wolfman. Um, is not certainly not the first of the Universal monster movies. It is the one that I probably enjoy the most as a point of discussion uh, because I think it's a fascinating movie. The story of Lon Chaney Jr. I find fascinating. Um, it, it's just an interesting movie to me. And before we launch into all of that, when when did you first run across The Wolf Man? I keep wanting to call it the Wolfman because that kind of thing makes me laugh. Uh, but <laughs> like Spider-Man. Spider um, but it is the Wolfman. It is. It is. Like I said, two distinct words. But when did like did I? I would assume you saw this as a kid, as we all did, if we're horror fans. Uh, yeah. Actually, I fell backwards into Universal horror in about first grade. Um, I've been kind of aware of that kind of stuff, but like kindergarten and before. I was forbidden to really watch this kind of stuff and was constantly being ushered away from any like rental stores uh, horror aisle, even though I couldn't stop staring at the covers. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I got into first grade, and I know it has to be first grade because that's when I got the school switched because of uh, getting put into the gifted program, there were these amazing uh, orange covered books, the Crestwood House Monster Series that I was checking out from the library there. And I think they had the whole series at this new school that I got put in in first grade. And I checked out, we would go to the library once a day to give our teacher a break from us. And uh, <laughs> that, that was like a scheduled thing that our school did. And uh, at the library, we were allowed to check out a book a day. We could check out one book a day and we couldn't have more than like five or whatever. So I literally would check these books out, these Crestwood Monster House. Oh, yeah, Monster yeah, yeah. I'm looking at the out. pictures right now. I, re I do recognize these. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, and I I checked out one a day, um, every day, and I would just cycle through there. I think there was like seven of them, but basically by Friday, I could have all, pretty much all of this series minus like two books, I think, that I could take home for the weekend. <laughs> so like I was obsessed with these books and I got them every day. And if you looked at the library card, it was like court psyops, court psyops, court psyops, court psyops, court psyops, court psyops. <laughs> and it's like an, you know, it's like every couple of days. And I literally I would turn it in, wait a day, and then check it out. That's how it was supposed to be. That was how they could make sure everybody could get a book. But nobody ever got these books but me. And eventually a couple other kids got interested in them too. And then that's how um like I got a couple of friends that were into the monsters as much as I was. But I got super obsessed with them, and my mom took notice of this. So she took us, she took me and my sister to the county library, which had just started renting videotapes. And lo and behold, they had all the Universal Monster series. So sometime around first grade, somewhere probably about mid-year, I sit down and watch Wolfman for the first time. 
And what do the kids these days say? I felt seen. Yeah, yeah. I felt so seen and understood at even that young of an age. Well, yeah, we'll get into it. Like a lot of times when we're doing these conversations, when we get to the themes, like we, we did Deep Rising not so very long ago on this show. And when you do a movie like Deep Rising, it's like, well, there's not that much to talk about thematically. I mean, it's mo it's a sea monster and then there's a cat burglar and this we're not delving too far into subtext or Freudian psychology. I mean, I could if you really wanted me to force it. That's the whole bit of my show. Well, yeah, right. You know, clip. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> the the thing about the universal monsters in particular and it's something that you can either point to Kurt Siedmak or George Wagner who the the writer and director of this movie respectively uh who did a lot of these universal monster movies that one of the two is probably responsible for really introducing the idea of of kind of in, uh, inserting psychology into these movies um you know val luton gets a lot of credit for it but this, the val luton stuff was after this and there is no getting around the fact that the wolfman in particular and i mean you can argue too like uh dr trickle and mr hyde and uh dracula has some sexual repression stuff and that kind of thing but but the wolfman is a uniquely psychological kind of movie. And by the way, just a little footnote, as we're talking about these Crestwood books, when I saw the cover of the Bigfoot and Loch Ness monster ones in particular, I was like, son of a bitch. I read those repeatedly. I can't believe I haven't thought back on these Crestwood books. I'm going to, this is a thing that's going to like eBay, uh, obsess, uh, for my life for a while. Like I'm going to, oh. That's that's funny. You're also going to spend a lot of money if you try to get those. The the Bigfoot ones may not be as popular, but like the Godzilla one, like really beat up and destroyed, goes for a hundred and some odd bucks at least, if not yeah. more. I managed to actually find someone selling them on Etsy as a craft item because they thought someone who would like paper cut might want the images to do stuff with. And I found someone that sold them all for like 14 bucks each. Um, oh, wow. and, and I got I got almost all of them they didn't have the godzilla one but i got almost all of them in the series but more importantly i got the main five that i was checking out which was all the main monsters basically and i think i even ended up getting like the mad scientist and some other stuff too but i, I didn't get the godzilla one damn it and that's the one that i definitely love because that's where my love of godzilla came from uh, i knew of godzilla before that but that book sealed it when that was one in the series and i'm so happy that i got them and the funny thing about the particular books that I bought, I bought them from an Etsy seller in, I think, like Oregon or somewhere on the West Coast. And when the books got shipped to me, they came from the Omaha Public School Library. They actually still have like stamps on them and stuff from the Omaha Public School Library. And it has the card still in there with some of the last names that were checked out for some of the books. I, want, yeah, I wonder if you can find those in a library still, because the cheaper way to go about it is just to get a library card and steal the books. I couldn't deprive kids of such things. Oh, uh, yeah, see, that's where we differ. Uh, I will I will ruin a childhood in a heartbeat. Um, <laughs> oh, and on, on another note, um, the kids in the Omaha Public School Library took care of these books rather well. There's very minimal damage done to them and uh were i to want to sell them they are worth quite a bit for the obsessive collector like myself yeah i need to check into it. this is a this is one of those things i'll mention to my girlfriend and be like you know i don't know that i would ever spend money on this but i do have birthdays and, and holidays coming up and perhaps if you would like to spend money uh on them that would be great so <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I have that I, I have that kind of language with my wife too, where it's like, man, I would really love to have that, but man, it's a little spendy. Yeah, you know, I just, I just don't know if I could. I don't, you know, I just, I don't know, man. I really want it though. <laughs> I know you're talking about getting a gazebo, but what if instead you got books for Bo instead <laughs> of a gazebo? <laughs> You see, these books were a huge part of my childhood that I didn't even realize until a friend of mine brought it up, and now yeah. I must own them all. 
Right. And also, while you're at it, I'm going to need some replica Revel model kits. And if you can do those things, then perhaps I will deign to make love to you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Wait, I forget. I've lost the plot. If I, am I being offered this? Because I could probably make that happen. Uh, I would... <laughs> I was thinking of saying this to my girlfriend, but if we want to get romantic on this show, I think that can only help the ratings. <laughs> well, there's that. And I mean, I have most of that offer because I have some of those books. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, just all offline, we'll talk about like, is it like a handy for one? Is it, do I got to do the full blowy? <laughs> 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 Am I? <laughs> it, it's a top for two, I think, is the the natural exchange for that. Um, at any rate, yeah. So I saw the Wolfman obviously when I was a kid because it, it was <laughs> back in the days when you would watch television and you would just watch whatever came on. Um, the Wolfman was one of those movies that would pop up every now and again like on a saturday or sunday afternoon you know whenever the local stations did creature features and stuff like that uh wolfman would would pop up and i remember as a kid thinking the wolfman was really cool and i didn't really care about anything else and now as an adult i feel like i've gone through this you know willy wonka tunnel where on the other side of it I think the the Wolfman scenes are kind of the least interesting scenes of the movie. And the ones that I really love are seeing Lon Chaney Jr. struggle with this idea of like, geez, pop, I'm about to become a horrible monster and murder everyone. Uh, but I, I and, and I, it's because I fell in love with, you know, like this and Dracula and, and uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon is a big one for me. Um, but you know, those movies kind of captured my imagination and it wasn't until much later I realized like, oh no, these were actual you know, like professional movie makers trying to say something with these movies in a way that I think a lot of people tend to dismiss, um, particularly these early universal movies, because the assumption is that, you know, uh, the, you know, they're, they're quaint. Um, which they are. There is no getting around that. But um, they're also fairly layered. Uh, not, you know, again, the Dracula stuff is all about, like, doing it. But something like The Wolfman, as, as an adult, I've really grown to appreciate as, uh, like, a, an honest-to-goodness work of art. And also taken... <laughs> taken with the the story of Lon Chaney Jr. at the same time and how the character of Larry Talbot and the person of personage of Lon Chaney Jr. is eerily similar um that they were both kind of haunted by demons and, and dad issues <laughs> oh, oh for sure yeah 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 um but uh, but all right so let's get into it and we'll we'll you know talk about some of this along the way but um, so one of my favorite things in the world is the universal logo of this time period of the like late thirties and forties, where you have the airplane going around the globe with the, bum, 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 bum. I love that shit. <laughs> um, it, it makes me so happy. And anyway, my personal favorite is when it was all of them that they would just give you a brief glimpse of all of them throughout the years i forget what anniversary it was that they did that but i really dug that one you got to see how it evolved over time but yes the plane going around is definitely a mark of a film that you're going to enjoy in black and white yeah and th then you get the opening of like all the the actors like you know claude rains and lon cheney jr and uh, uh oh i'm gonna forget her name immediately um, Evelyn Anchors, isn't it? Yes, 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 yes. Evelyn Anchors, and uh, of course Maria Uspinskaya. 
Uh, yeah, I've, I've heard that pronounced uh, a couple of different ways, so I don't even know if Ubinskaya or Upskinskaya. I don't know what the correct one is. There, I, I was listening to the commentary from a film historian, and he used Uspinskaya, so that's what I'm going with. Because if I'm wrong, then he's fucking wrong. Uh, that works for me. So anyway, but it, it's the that kind of shot of like, oh, here's a little bit from there from. Uh, uh, you know the the scene in the movie uh, to introduce the characters, and the thing that's interesting about that is that I think the only one that had done it before this was the Raven, and then they brought it back for the Wolfman. I I might have that wrong, but there there's a movie that used it previously, and then they kind of knocked it off. And then they brought it back for the Wolfman. Um, and as the movie opens, uh, after we get a, l- a little glimpse of everybody, we zoom in on uh, a bunch of books. And somebody pulls out <laughs> the, the one on uh, an encyclopedia, the L's, and opens it up to lycanthropy. And it's like, hey, uh, also known as werewolfism, uh, which I don't know that has ever been called a werewolfism anywhere else but uh werewolfism is uh you know it's basically when you 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 turn into a wolf on account of being bitten by one and whatnot and uh you go on murderous rampages and also uh by the way we're going to talbot castle and all this is in the encyclopedia (laughs) it's kind of interesting because a lot of werewolf lore pre this movie has nothing to do with the rules and regulations that are in this movie but it also became the template for all werewolf stories in the future even when people reference every other form of werewolf whether it's through magical power like a belt that they create to turn themselves into a wolf or whether it is some type of a magical curse that turns them into a wolf on a full moon or whatever the previous werewolf mythology was Everyone that thinks they know what true werewolf mythology is, is referencing this movie Uh without even knowing it. And that's the beauty of this. It pulls a fucking Kaiser Soze on you and makes you believe that it's the real truth of how werewolf myths are. Yeah, like there's old school stuff that I really like about like, oh, if you drink water out of a wolf's paw, that's how you become a werewolf and stuff. And this movie's like, no, 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 fuck all that. You just got to get attacked by a wolf. And if you survive it, then you're a wolf now. And like all this stuff about, uh, you know, trans, uh, the, the pentagram and like everything from, uh, American werewolf in London, the howling, like the, you know, the big werewolf movies of the eighties, all of that stuff comes or, you know, and obviously the hammer stuff, it all comes from this movie. It's not, it doesn't come from like the rich history of werewolves. It is just Kurt Siavak making a bunch of shit up. And he had done a bunch of research to his credit, but he also just had a bunch of crazy make ups like the whole, you know, even a man who is pure as in heart and says his prayer at night. That is all him. He just made it up. Yeah, it's a wonderful world building, culture building, and just mythos and mythology building hour and nine minutes. It's amazing how they packed all of that into this story and it just sideloads it into your brain and you just press I believe. And it culturally changed the way werewolves were perceived across the world. Yeah, yeah, it invented it. it it, this is to werewolves what Night of the Living Dead is to zombies. Like, everything yeah. after it is based on this. Yeah, and, and the history pre what zombies would have been before Night of the Living Dead has been erased from people's minds for the most part. Yeah, right. Like, if you watch White Zombie, you're like, these ain't zombies. And <laughs> Right, but if you know your history, you're like, oh, wait, those are zombies. <laughs> yeah. I've been using that word wrong. I don't think it means what I thought it means. Right, yeah. Um, and even George, Papa Bear himself, George Romero, would have said he, you know, he called them ghouls, not zombies. Which uh, is the lost universal monster bringing us right back to June. Yeah. Uh, so, anywho. Oh, here's another thing about this movie in terms of world building and stuff. The, do you know the, the one thing 
well, there's plenty of stuff you don't see in this movie. But the one thing you would expect to see in this movie you never see. Full moon. That's right. There is not a single shot of a moon. Which no. later, later they would, <laughs> in the later incarnations of the Wolfman movies with Lon Chaney Jr. Because he reprised the role a number of times. Um, but yeah. Hi, Tommy. Yeah, no. Oh, this cat. Um, but yeah, <laughs> he, uh, uh, they, there is no moon in this one, but there, the, you yeah, know, the moon will appear in later films. Um, so yeah, I think it is to date, as far as I understand, it may be the only werewolf movie that doesn't feature a single shot of the moon. Yeah. Which is, again, if you're the first one, it, it's up to you to invent all this shit and they just never got around to it. So, uh, cause it, like you said, it's an hour and nine minutes and we're going to, do our damnedest not to double that uh in talking about it but um i'm so, holding back as much as i can <laughs> sure don't hold back too much uh you know let the lo loosen that belt um <laughs> so as, as the movie opens it's uh larry talbot as played by lon cheney jr he is returning home to talbot castle uh, with his father, Claude Rains, uh, in charge. And he's coming back because his brother has has died tragically, and, and his brother was older, was set to essentially take over the mantle of being, you know, the, the, the guy who inherited the castle, and one presumes the family business of being rich or whatever. And... <laughs> Yeah, it's like some kind of English aristocracy, but he was raised in America and therefore American accent. Yeah, it is. I guess so. I, and I'm not the first person to make this joke, but like when you first meet Claude Rains as his father, this movie is like, well, hello, Lawrence. You're looking well. And he's like, hey, howdy, pop. <laughs> you know, and you're like, oh, OK, I get it. Uh, he is not this man's son in any way he's also about three feet taller than claude rains and, and a good foot and a half wider at the shoulders yeah, yeah. and unless claude rains married uh, a bigfoot and <laughs> this this is the product of that unholy union um it's hard to imagine how he, his loins would produce a man like lon cheney jr who's a big dude like this is a guy who you know, uh, all right. So for listeners, here's the the quick backstory of Lon Chaney Jr. Obviously, his father was Lon Chaney, who was the Man of a Thousand Faces, and did uh, the Phantom of the Opera and London After Midnight, uh, that one of the most famous lost films ever. But Hunchback of Notre Dame and uh, a million movies was known for doing his own makeup. Uh, his parents were deaf, so. He, he had learned early to not only use sign language, but to be very expressive with uh, his face and uh, be performative with them in a lot of ways. And that's kind of his story. Like, he learned sign language and sh uh, honestly uh, went on to teach Lon Chaney Jr. when he was a kid. Who, by the way, his name was Creighton Chaney, not Lon. Uh, yeah, studio decision. Well, yeah, kind of, it, it was basically like, so, the story is, Lon Chaney Jr., or Lon Chaney, rather, um, is, of course, incredibly famous, incredibly popular, but he just tortured himself uh, being in the film business. Like, the, the Hunchback of no Notre Dame uh, makeup in particular was notable as much for how good it was at the time as how painful it was for him to wear, and it caused him chronic pain for the rest of his life yeah and, i mean this is a man who glued wire to his eyelids to push them open and down and then painted the backs of his eyelids black to give a much more stark and grotesque image to his visage for a movie that is now lost yeah oh man that london after midnight stuff looks so good um yeah it's a horrifying creature yeah so, but Lon Chaney did not want his son Creighton to go into the family business. Uh, he didn't want him to be an actor because he thought it, it was kind of a shitty job and it was unreliable, you know? And so he pushed Creighton into trade school and basically strong armed the man who would later be Lon Chaney Jr. into opening a plumbing company 
And the other fun story I like about Lon Chaney and his son is that uh, the, the apocryphal story goes that Lon Chaney Jr., Creighton Jr., or Creighton Chaney, was born dead. And Lon Chaney took the dead baby to the nearest lake, which was freezing, and dumped the baby into the cold water, and that, like, kickstarted his heart or something. Um, th- it's hard to believe that that's true, but it's a pretty good story. Well, if you believe that, then Howling Wolf also got his voice from a strange man that walked out of a cemetery and made him a deal at midnight. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh so, I mean, it sure sounds like that's what his voice came from. And, you know, Lon Chaney Jr. definitely has something about him that's just otherly, yeah. which makes him so perfect for playing monsters. And, you know, that mythos only helps. <laughs> well, and so Lon, Lon Chaney Jr., uh, before he was ever called Lon Chaney Jr., he ends up uh, going kind of bankrupt when the Great Depression hits and his plumbing business folds. So he ends up doing a couple of, you know, like C level movies as Creighton Chaney. And it's it's sort of after his father has died, some you know, kind of tragically young, um, all things being equal, uh, that he was told by the studios, like, look, we cannot get you a starring role as Creighton Chaney, but if you change your name to Lon Chaney Jr., well, maybe we can make something happen for you. Um, and even then, they really couldn't until he played Lenny in a film adaptation of, of Mice and Men. And Yeah, that definitely put him on the map. That showed that he was more than just a big oaf. He, right. Well, he played a big oaf, right? So yeah, but he did it so well, you know. Yeah, and it, it really is a good performance. It, there, there's no getting ready. It, it's, it is more subtle than the John Malkovich <laughs> version of Lenny, to be sure. Uh, but yeah, so Lon Chaney Jr. was living in the shadow of his father, um, you know, who had died, but he was he was the man of a thousand faces, and he was a great star. And now his son, Lon Chaney Jr., is about to start making horror movies, just like his father did. And the first time at bat isn't the Wolfman. It's actually, uh, oh, what is it called? The Mad Monster? Something like that. Yeah, that's mega low budget. Yeah, but it's the first time that Universal was like, hey, are you interested in, in playing you know the this kind of monstrous sort of character which he was you know i mean he he was floundering in uh in smaller roles and so he he's in this low budget movie and then uh they offer him the wolfman and they're like look this is kind of what your father did this is going to be uh you know it's a fairly big budget high profile uh universal movie and it's doing what daddy did it is being in uh man-made monster that's the name of it um but yeah so you're gonna graduate from mad made monster into the wolfman just a year later and we'll see how that goes and then he turns in you know the performance in here which uh is is like I said that I I'm less intrigued by his performance as the Wolfman than I am his performance as Larry Talbot because I think even he understood that he's kind of playing himself. You know that this is a dude who is like Lon Chaney Jr.'s father was dead. He and he's now standing to inherit this mantle of being this horror actor slash icon playing a guy whose older brother has died and so now he's returning home to inherit the mantle of being the heir to this grand estate and uh claude rains who i love he's so effing good in this movie as he is in everything claude rains is one of my favorite like pre uh mpaa actors uh he is he is tremendous and 
Uh, Claude Rains greets him and is just like, you know, well, Eddie, you're looking well. Um, so, how about you come take a look at my telescope for a minute? And so, it turns out Lon Chaney Jr. knows how to calibrate telescopes because he had done some work uh, like that in the States. But he kind of admits to his father, he's like, I don't really have a, a brain for mathematics. Like, that stuff kind of confuses me. But I can do this. I'm good with my hands. Which, again, feels very Lon Chaney Jr. to me. Of Like, this is a dude who's not a great thespian. Uh, not that his father, you know, his father worked mostly in silent films, so it's it's tough to say. But certainly was iconic at the time, at least. And now here's Lon Chaney Jr., who is kind of oafish looking. Like, he's just, he's a big son of a bitch. And that's the part that he's been playing. Like, he, he's, you know, guy number three who gets punched by Crash Corrigan and cereals and stuff. Yeah, he's the heavy that gets jumping across the table and doing the flying uh, head scissor takeovers in those like uh, Crimson Ghost serials and shit. He's that guy. Yeah, yeah. Like he worked as a stuntman for a while because it was the only work in movies he could get, especially back when he was, you know, just good old Creighton Chaney. And yeah, I, I find all that stuff really fascinating. Again, the the parallels between Lon Chaney Jr. and, and this character are uh, astounding. Um, but yeah, so as he's, as they're setting up this, uh, telescope in very body double fashion, Lon Chaney Jr. just starts peeping, uh, in the town below seeing what's going on. You know, the, the aristocrats looking down on the plebeians who live in the city below. And Oh, I do believe that that was extremely intentional knowing C. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and he starts spying on the uh, the eventual lady love of the movie, uh, Gwen, as played by Evelyn Akers, who was a British actress who had to work very, very hard to not sound British. Um, and mostly gets there. And anyway, he's sees her working, or uh, trying on earrings above uh, like a little pawn shop. And he's like, well, I'll see you in a little bit, Pop. I'm going to go down here and hit on this lady and try not to admit that I was spying on her from our mansion. And Which he does poorly in all of that. Yeah, he is not uh, much of a Lothario. Um, but yeah, so he, he goes to Conliff's Antique Shop is the name of the place where he tries to his version of playing it smooth is to be like, hey, I'd like some of those earrings as a gift. A really specific kind of earring. And she's like, oh, well, uh, we've got these and these. He's like, no, no, no. I want one that's a, a half moon. I saw you trying them on in your room. And she's like, the fuck? And uh, he, he pretends like he's psychic is the gag. Yeah, but he's only psychic when it comes to recognizing jewelry being put on by pretty women or some bullshit like really bad line well yeah well he starts uh fingering a cane which is going to come into play in a bit and some of those canes had very phallic ends for the handles as well in their like right in frame yeah and uh he picks up a, a cane that's got a silver wolf head as the the handle and he's like well where's this from and she says, oh, don't you know? I thought you were psychic. And he says, well, only if it has a pulse and blue eyes. And she's like, oh, I see what's going on here. Um, I guess He's I... being what the ladies used to call a masher. Yeah. <laughs> and she's like, well, I probably should tell you that I've got a boyfriend. And he's like, oh, well, uh, whatever. I'll take this here cane. I'll... This will make a nice gift for my pop. And, uh, and he's like, oh, by the way, uh, this doesn't mean anything, does it? It's a wolf head with a pentagram on it. And this is the first time we get, uh, which is honestly one of my favorite bits of werewolf lore, where uh, Gwen says for the first time, well, even a man who is pure and hot and says his prayers by night may become a wolf when the wolf bane blooms and the autumn moon is bright. Again, total invention for this film, but it rocks. 
<laughs> yeah, it sounds like a roughly translated poem that doesn't rhyme that's supposed to teach you something about a mythical creature that you need to watch out for. Yeah. And as they're kind of strolling outside, they see that the uh, the, the circus has come to town, which is uh, he- headed up by Bela Lugosi playing Bela. And, uh, I don't know if they're necessarily a circus or if they're just a group of travelers that show up. Yeah, I think the idea is that they're kind of a Romani, you know, group kind of rolling through town. And uh, there's Maleva, as played by Maria Uspenskaya, who was born in Russia, came to the United States, and became an acting teacher. And um, <laughs> she can teach you how to look very dour at everyone and be upset all the time. Dude, she's got a face like a catcher's mitt. And. <laughs> I don't. I don't mean that that makes her a bad person or nothing. I'm saying she, when you look at her, you're like, "Oh my God, she is going to curse me." <laughs> she has a very dour, very downturned look to her mouth at all times. Even when she's like trying to not seem so like angry, she just looks like she's constantly upset at everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really good. I re- I really like uh, her look in this movie, and I think it was. George Wagner even uh, the director of the movie who said like kind of without her this movie doesn't work because you need somebody that that's that has that sort of gravitas and that sense of mysticism and just being weird Uh, I go back to the uh, amazing yeah amazing stories episode with Bronson Pinchot talking about making a mummy movie in the swamp where he says, I don't know, I mean, the, everything out here, it's all weird, and the atmosphere's weird, and it gives the, this movie the atmosphere we need. I think we're really making something special, or a big piece of crap. It's really hard to tell right now. <laughs> uh, but it's to, to have Bella Lugosi and Maria Uspenskaya as your two main groups from, or two main folks from the group of travelers, or Romani, or whomever they may be, Uh, it really gives you a way of just kind of telling you everything you need to know about that group by how the actors are portraying themselves because they're like two sides of the opposite coin. One is the, you know, just leave us alone and (laughs) and everything will be fine type personality where they're like, I just don't want to talk to you and they just kind of move away. And that's Uspenskaya's character. And although she does become helpful later on, Mm -hmm. but... And there's Bella Lugosi's character, who is, you know, reading the fortunes and all of that kind of stuff. And they're 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 more of the type where they will invite you into the group because they have something to sell you, and or you know, do some trade with you or something along those lines. You know, where they they welcome the the outsider into the group. And I I like the way that they portray both of those types is how it's sort of a defense mechanism where one is overly inviting and and you know reads fortunes and all of that kind of stuff and does the trade and all of that and then the other one is just very dour and very much like no <laughs> yeah yeah well in a ter- <laughs> and also Bela who spoilers everyone is a werewolf um probably shouldn't be quite as gregarious as he is where he's just inviting people back to his tent late at night but eh whatever you would think that someone who travels all the time would be more mindful of the cycles of the moon where they are at. Right, or just not, again, don't invite strangers from the town back to your place after dark. Just keep it all in the daylight and you're fine. But anyway. Especially if you know that you are a werewolf. Yes, conduct your business with townies during the day, for God's sakes. Yeah, for sure. And and that's one of the reasons that Maleva is just so put out by all of this is she's like, oh, son of a bitch, Bela. Now I gotta, I gotta deal. I gotta clean up your messes from when you turn into a giant dog and eat people. <laughs> Always with the eating people. This one, uh, just anyway. So after they see, uh, the, the travelers coming through town, uh, Larry hosts it back up to uh, the castle because he's done you know rubbing elbows with the poor people <laughs> and he there's a great scene here where he talks to his dad about the you know this poem about the werewolf and he gives him this cane as a gift and everything and uh, he's like uh, his father Sir John uh, played by Claude Rain says 
Yeah, I mean, the, it, you have to understand that the, the locals believe that we're kind of a backwards people, uh, is the way he puts it. That, you know, we're, yes, we're, we're superstitious. And I like the fact that it's not them, it's we. You know, it's like, that just in this part of the world, we're a little more superstitious about this stuff. So, you know, do we believe it? Mm, but we don't not believe it, if you can, you know, dig that. And Larry's like, oh, you're crazy, Pop. Anyway, I'm going to go stalk this woman a little more. <laughs> Got to go be a master, Pop. <laughs> right. Another clip. Uh, I'm I'm hoping that uh, they'll let me watch, Pop. <laughs> yep, something like that. I'm, Gwen's going to cuck me, Pop. <laughs> so, anyway. He heads down to the village because uh, Gwen is having a date with her guy. Um... But it, it turns out that uh, oh no, this isn't her her guy. It's uh, her friend uh, Jenny, who is going to go to the Romani camp uh, together. So um, anyway, Larry is like, yeah, I'll go with you with the two of you, pretty ladies. And along the way, they see some wolfsbane, and Jenny recites the same poem uh, just to make sure that nobody is missing out on the subtlety of hey there's a, there are going to be werewolves here in a minute and yeah, there's a reason why this film rewrote the lore of werewolfism because it drills it into your fucking head right yeah that's why there's this mandela effect of like oh wait i know i heard that poem somewhere before it's like no you heard it three times in the same movie and that's why you, wait till we get to the the thorny paths that everybody's walking on um, <laughs> right it's like fucking hammer time with all the hawthorn trees everywhere yeah so interesting thing about the trees that when, when they walk through this forest this was all a big sound stage that they did but it, it looks really good it's a really creepy looking set and in addition to pumping out a bunch of mist that was probably carcinogenic um <laughs> they're the they got a bunch of trees that they brought onto the set and they painted them black and then coated them in glycerin so that the lights would make it look like it had just been raining or something it's a really cool effect uh, again people making this movie knew what they were doing and they were they were certainly trying to set a mood uh, it's definitely ahead of its time for the set design for the forest because it still has that German expressionist feel to it because the trees don't make sense and the geometry doesn't feel right yeah. but it's just realistic enough to where it makes it feel like it's a real true forest that just also happens to be constantly foggy to the point where you can't see your feet <laughs> another kind of ahead of its time thing it, and this sounds like such a little thing but you see a lot of ceilings in this movie which sounds like nothing but it's like this movie and citizen kane are kind of the first examples of like oh we're gonna put a roof on this set so that it looks like a real place as opposed to just letting it look like a stage and it's again it seems like such a small thing now but at the time of like oh when he goes into the you know the the antique shop you see the roof of the antique shop and some of the all the rooms that he's in you see the roofs and are the ceilings and that kind of thing wasn't really that common in movies um, because of the way they were filmed. I mean, it was like everybody was shooting a play and so that it, you, all they had were three walls uh, and the floor uh, so that they could, you know, rig lights and move the camera around and stuff like that. But anyway, I find that interesting. You know, yeah, it's not something that I've ever actually noticed myself, but now that you mentioned it, it seems to me that it adds an air of reality to it that the other movies wouldn't have, which at the time would really bring people more into this world and make them feel like it's actually a thing that they're experiencing or like a real thing that they're seeing because there's actually ceilings and everything like that. So you I think that may have added to the effect with like in such a subtle and subconscious way that I think it's a really brilliant decision to do, especially that early because a horror film really demands that you feel that that world is real in order for the threat to transfer to you that you should be scared and i think it helps this film maintain that more so than the other universals that are just the sets and the walls yeah it, it I, I think it really works um so 
they're going to uh, the camp. Bela is like, please come into my tent. I will read your fortune. Especially but enter of your own free will and please crane your neck in my direction. <laughs> yeah. And bring a little bit of your happiness with you. Um, <laughs> so he, he starts to read uh, this girl Jenny's poem and Bela sees uh, a, a pentagram on her hand. And he's like, "You get the fuck out of here now!" And she's like, "What? What did you? What did you see? Tell me!" And he's like, "No, I can't. But uh, if you wouldn't mind on your way out, maybe dumping a little salt or some A1 on yourself, that would be really good." <laughs> I have this dry rub. I should have you take on. Right. You just put a little bit on the tender part of the neck. <laughs> this this will keep you safe. Why does it say Lowry's on it? Just put it on. The tender part of the neck. <laughs> so, anyway, off she goes. She's upset about all of this. Uh, Larry and Gwen are chit-chatting about the fact that Gwen's about to get married. Uh, and she's having eh, not really doubts about it, but, uh, you know. It, it, He's it, kind it, of the only hunk in this burned-out burg. And while she's, like, got something that's worth keeping a hold of, at the same time, she could do much better if she looks to the big slap of man meat that's also a gonna be a werewolf in a couple minutes yeah and so uh after they end up taking off uh like jenny's all upset and she's like we're i'm going home and um they hear after jenny takes off into the woods they hear a, a wolf howl and so larry runs to help her uh to to help jenny and shows up in time to see a wolf, a.k.a. a big dog, uh, named Moose, by the way, um, attacking Jenny. And Moose, the dog, then turns on uh, Larry Talbot and starts attacking him. And then he ends up beating the, the wolf, in quotes, uh, to death with this silver-tipped cane. It doesn't look worse than a killer shrew. You know, the, yeah, you're right about that. Uh, <laughs> every time I, I think about Attack of the Killer Shrews, I, 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 I can't help but think about the Mystery Science Theater version where uh, in the interstitial scenes, Crow and Tom Servo just wore shitty, like, welcome rugs and made this, like, <laughs> sound. Yeah, and they just kept doing it no matter how much they were begged to be stopped. Yeah, it was very, very funny. <laughs> I remember that episode now. Yeah. Oh, Attack of the Killer Shrews is a terrific MST episode. Um, <laughs> I remember watching that as a kid and, like, even as a little kid being like, this shit is weak. Yeah. It's, that's <laughs> but a I can't movie. stop watching it. <laughs> I know. All right. So, interesting thing about the dog Moose. Moose bit Lon Chaney Jr. pretty good. Uh, hard enough that it broke one of the bones between his thumb and forefinger when they were shooting this. Wow. Yeah. But Lon Chaney Jr., who was a, a, an incredible animal lover, not only wasn't like, I want someone to kill this dog. He adopted the dog from the trainer. And the story goes that Moose followed him onto every set until Moose's passing. That he just, that dog was everywhere. There are pictures of him. I think it's dressed up like the wolf man showing a script to the dog <laughs> that's a terrific picture I, I gotta find that yeah it's pretty good uh but yeah apparently like wherever lon cheney jr went to shoot a movie moose went with him that he, that he was uh, a big animal lover and he and moose had a very good relationship um so larry though in the movie he's been bitten by this wolf who is now dead and uh, you know, kind of staggers away and Gwen comes on him and is uh, they see Maleva passing by in her cart and uh, she's like, yes I will help him get home to his castle and so they do they take him home, uh, get him to bed, uh, somebody rushes in and is like, oh by the way, Jenny was found dead and they call a doctor uh, to check on Lon Chaney Jr. but by the next morning, like, his wounds are pretty much healed. 
and the only thing that they they find is that um, when they go to Jenny's body, Bela's body is found near her, along with uh, his cane, with Lon Chaney Jr.'s cane. There doesn't seem to be evidence that the Bela character was beaten profusely about the head and ears with a cane, either. Right. Well, you know, it's 1941. We're not going to get too gruesome. But yeah, it's not like you know, the medical report was like he was murdered by having his skull bashed in. And I think the way that they they chalk it up in the movie is, oh, he was probably killed by the wolf too. And then, you know, Larry uh, managed to kill the wolf that had then killed Belly and Jenna, Bella and Jenny. And anyway, but yeah, so he wakes up and everybody's like, uh, hey, did, uh, is this your cane? And Lon Chaney Jr. is like, yeah, 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 that's mine. I killed the wolf with that thing. And uh, his father tells him, like, well, listen, Daddy, they didn't find a wolf, but they did find a body of a gypsy. Um, were you out killing gypsies last night, Larry? And he's like, no, 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 I got attacked by a wolf. Let me show you. I got bite marks right here oh well i guess they're gone huh well um yeah i guess i'm okay and so uh they they end up burying bela in town there was a, a ceremony held for him and um i think it's important to note that randolph duke is actually pretty dubious about this the one that's investigating and he wonders why the cane was found there but it doesn't appear that the cane was what was the thing that kills bella because they just give him the cane back so they can't think that it's an actual murder weapon because even back then they would have kept it as evidence yeah they're well yeah they're just like hey i guess the rich guy might have something to do with the like, you're, you're right like he, he he's not satisfied with the story but there's not a better explanation but he'll bet somebody a dollar he's gonna figure it out yeah Right. <laughs> Maybe his brother Donamichi. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so anyway, when when Larry goes to this, you know, very poorly attended service for Bela at this church, um, he is interrupted by Maleva who shows up to you know, it turns out Bela is her son, and she recites this poem that goes the way you walked was thorny through no fault of your own but as the rain enters the soil the river enters the sea so tears run to a predestined end your suffering is over Bela my son now you will find peace and so she takes off and then Larry goes to the uh, coffin and then cries a bunch meanwhile uh, there's some business with Gwen and her father saying like hey don't worry about what what happened to Jenny there's no way you can be accused of anything you had nothing to do with this and she's like I know I, I'm not I'm not worried about that um, and then a bunch of old biddies show up to give her a hard time as well uh, who are like you know you you essentially got Jenny killed like maybe you didn't kill her but she should never, you should have been watching her. You shouldn't have let her run off into the woods alone. I think this was like a grieving family member or a group of grieving family members that came to slut shame her, basically. Uh, yeah, basically. Like, hey, you were catting around with Larry Talbot instead of paying attention to her daughter and the rest of us are angry on her behalf. And so Larry shows up and he's like, get out of here, you ladies. And they do. Uh, <laughs> but he does it a lot more angrily and says, go ahead and say it. What is it that you're trying to say? You just go ahead and say it now that I'm here. Like, he's basically like, give me an excuse to hurt you. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, he's he's got anger issues, to be sure. <laughs> like I said, I felt seen when I saw this as a kid. Yeah. And uh, we get a little bit of lore here where a dog is barking at Larry and he's like, well, that's weird because most dogs really like me. I don't know what's going on. They're like, uh, we're probably nothing. It's not like you're a werewolf or something. And 
<laughs> so he meets Gwen's boyfriend for the first time and goes to shake his hand. And there's a really like cold moment where uh, Andrews is the guy's name, just looks at his hand and is like, uh, I'm not shaking the hand of the dude making time with my lady. <laughs> You'll forgive me if I'm not polite to the man who's trying to steal my woman from me. Right. So, uh, and Larry kind of read the room is like, uh, I'm going to take off. And at... <laughs> right, right. Trying to cuckold you. Sorry about that. Going to move on now. Right. Flip. <laughs> <laughs> and Andrews is like, oh, sorry. It, it's no, it's not the fact that he was trying to cuckold me. It's the fact that uh, he had this walking stick and I was kind of mesmerized by it. And as he's talking to Gwen, he says, there's something very tragic about that man. I'm sure nothing but harm will come to you through him. Uh, which is both prescient and some raw shit to say. Uh, <laughs> some people speak truth like that, where the first thing that they think that even if it's that fucking grim of a threat, it sounds like, you know, he's just going to fucking say it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, so... They go back to the, uh, Gwen and her, her boyfriend go back to this carnival, which is a celebration for Bela, which kind of riles up the locals who are like, well, this is kind of a, you know, not the way that you handle death, but they're like, no, 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 we're going to dance and make merry and, and that kind of thing. I think they have an issue with the paganality of such a thing because they're such a stuffed shirt going to the C of E in yes. somewhere that may or may not be Europe. <laughs> yeah, uh, right. And Larry shows up also at the same event. And this is where we get like the actual moment where uh, he confronts Maleva and she says, oh, you're a werewolf. And he's like, uh, that's stupid. And she, and she says, no, no, no. Vela became a wolf and you killed him. A werewolf can only be killed with silver bullet or a silver knife or a stick with a silver handle, which you had. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you this necklace that's got a pentagram on it, and this can break the evil spell. And and then she says, you know, the but the, the rule is this. Whoever is bitten by a werewolf and lives becomes a werewolf himself or herself. We don't want to gender this. <laughs> and... And Larry, Larry's like, well, I did get bitten by a, a wolf. And she's like, right. So uh, let me see that wound. And he's like, no, I'm not going to tell you nothing. And then he runs off. And uh, what, meanwhile, all of the other people in the, in this camp get word. They're like, hey, there's a werewolf. There's a werewolf. There's a werewolf. And they're like, time to go. <laughs> so they start. Yeah, and it's. Weird they react that way as soon as Lon Chaney Jr.'s character comes into the camp. Yeah. Well, word has gotten around fast, apparently. And you get the feeling that the travelers knew of Bela's affliction and knew to not be around when it was going to happen, even though Bela was doing the psychic thing on a night that he was going to change. Because none of them were hurt. None of them are found. Yeah, you know? it's a good question. Because you would think, a couple of questions here. Why did Maleva not just give this, you know, pentagram charm to, charm to Bela? And so that he wouldn't turn into a wolf man? I don't know. What what was the schedule like? Did they do, have to do like a spike, or not a spike, uh, what was the, the Buffy werewolf that uh, was, that they just locked away? Um, <laughs> yeah, the entombing yeah. kind of trick. Yeah, basically, you just put them in a cell until they're, the wolf part is done. Um, but yeah, I mean, you do that, but I, I don't know. A lot of good questions. Like, a, as much as I like this movie, I'm not saying that all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. Also, I was kind of thinking that perhaps you su you're supposed to wear it on the nights you're supposed to transform. And perhaps he was supposed to wear it, but didn't. And now that he's dead because he attacked someone as a wolf and was killed she's giving him the only relief that she can offer for what her son has cursed him with. Yeah, maybe so. Maybe that's the thing. I um, mean, the movie's not going to explain it for you, so if you're looking for it, you got to create it on your own. Sure, yeah. Do a little, uh, you know, the movie tie-in novelization. 
<laughs> which I'm always writing in my own head anyway. Well, and, and so what's kind of interesting about this is there was a version of this script in which Larry Talbot was actually named Larry Gill, was just a dude who was setting up the telescope for Claude Rains. And at no point did you see him turn into a werewolf. And the whole idea was that it, it, the question was, is he really turning into a werewolf or is this, it, has he just become unhinged and thinks he's turning into a werewolf? And the movie never answers that question. That's very Cedamok. He loves the psychology of monster. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, but finally somebody in the upper echelons of universal was like, what are you talking about? We want to see a werewolf. So he, I, I want to see the werewolf. And, uh, Justifiably so. Monster need be there. Make money. Yeah, yeah. Get get me Jack Pierce on the phone. Get him over <laughs> here with some yak hair and some spirit glue. And, <laughs> and a, a really, word. really hot iron that he's going to burn Lon Chaney with for not holding still all the fucking time because he's a sadist. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, uh, a lot of stories about Jack Pierce and Lon Chaney Jr. not getting along. And I think, I think it's because they were too peas from the same pod and neither one of them was going to uh give very much yeah um, one was an immovable object the other one was an unstoppable force yeah yeah and and in fact in later movies even where jack pierce was doing the makeup um word was that jack pierce did not do the wolfman makeup for lon cheney jr in the you know sequels and the movies moving forward just because they they didn't get along at all um, and it's really difficult to hear all of the stories of like the various just levels of asshole that these classic movie people were because you definitely get a very much more toxic environment that just the world that they lived in was much more toxic and had that much more just weird competitive just going after each other just for the sake of going after each other and just going head to head in competition and always tearing somebody else down to bring yourself up and that's just kind of the world of the way it was then it seems like the way that people would compete or at least that's how it's portrayed in you know the history books to me <laughs> yeah for sure like and and evelyn anchors was not spared that either apparently she and lon cheney jr did not get along very well either and... she got it lon cheney got into a punch up with her fucking kid and i don't think he was an adult when it happened yeah like like he beat up her kid Yes. as uh, something that happened on the set and the tenderness that is displayed on them between the two of them on screen is very much a testament to both of their acting but particularly evan anchors because sure. after that happened she definitely deserves any like anything that she wants to level at lon cheney for attacking her son like that she definitely can hate him for that yeah they they worked together a number of times after this movie. Um, but yeah, again, to her credit that she did not just, you know, poison this guy's booze, which he was drinking. Uh, <laughs> that, that's a thing we haven't really touched on too much yet, but Lon Chaney Jr., a little bit of a drinking problem, uh, by which I mean an incredible drinking problem. Yeah, so much so even at this point to where turning into a werewolf that you have no recollection of the horrible thing that you did but you have to deal with the next day mm -hmm. very much something that he would probably understand and be able to portray yeah again he is playing larry talbot because he is larry talbot yeah but instead of turning into a werewolf he's an alcoholic monster yeah when he gets that far gone and that's how he understands it yeah it's right but i think that's why his performance outside of the makeup is as good as it is is because he does not have to reach down very far to access those kinds of emotions and because we'll get to it all right so after they have uh after he's gotten this charm and gwen is like hey what's that and he's like oh it's supposed to keep me from turning into a werewolf isn't that stupid uh the <laughs> maleva told me i was i'm a werewolf now but i want you to have this uh, for your protection and he kisses her and while she's like hey man I've got a boyfriend I thought I made that clear Beyonce at this point yeah and this is where all the 
uh, the other people in the camp are just throwing their shit in the wagons like, we gotta go right now. <laughs> They're like, he's making a move on her. We gotta get out of here. We don't want to be a witness to this. Right. So they take off, and then, and so does Gwen. And so Larry it has this weird flashback of, like, all the weird shit that's been going on with Maleva and Bela and the cane and all kinds of stuff. Y'all seen Spellbound? Right. Hey, any, anybody, uh... Remember that montage of weird shit from uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? That. <laughs> it's really cool, though, and it is really, really well done, but it's very much of its time, too. Yeah. And so he goes, Larry runs back home to his castle where he kind of checks his arms and stuff. He's like, oh, whew, I thought I was going to turn into a werewolf. Time to take off these socks and shoes. And then it turns out his legs are really hairy. So he takes off his socks and uh, then he slowly turns into a werewolf while sitting in, in a chair. And I so want those as slippers, the little werewolf footies. Yeah, and he walks on his tippy toes. And it's... <laughs> I literally, if I could get these, if someone would make these as slippers, like where they actually look like those feet too, that weird latexy, which is probably a rigid Culloden that Jack Pierce built that out of. Mm -hmm. But if that, even if it, I want it to look like the wolf man's toes, I would walk around on my tippy toes if I had them. <laughs> I totally would. Yeah, and it's just, uh, like, the way they accomplish this, of course, is film dissolves. But if I can tell you anything about this transformation sequence... Uh, and it like it's an iconic look and and, and so forth, uh, and I don't mean to, you know, yada 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 the werewolf of the wolf man, but <laughs> um, well, we only see the feet at this point. We don't really see the actual full wolf. Like it's just the feet for the first transformation. Yeah, and uh, but the way that they did all of these transformations is that you know they're dissolving between shots, and the way they would do it is they would have a couple of. Uh, camera set up with soap lenses where they would basically draw an outline on the soap lens of Lon Chaney Jr. And so he would sit in a chair, they would drop they would draw these outlines then he would take off once they had that done get some more makeup applied then sit back down, he, they would line him up using the the outlines that they had drawn on these soap lenses and then they would shoot that for a second and then he would get up they would apply some more makeup he would sit down and make the adjustments and make sure that the head headrest was right so that he was perfectly lined up and of course the problem is you can't perfectly line that up so you can tell the dissolve is happening but you know at the time still pretty impressive and uh they solved the problem later on by creating a pillow that was made out of like a uh, plaster of paris like mm -hmm. bandages like they built it up that would hold his head perfectly and they just basically had him lay down and then they just shot that pillow but the it was built to fit his head so that his head would rest in the same spot every time and that's how the cross dissolves get better over time yeah but it you know it's it's again how do you when you don't have special effects like were evolved you know 50 years after this or 40 years after this um you know, the next best one is American Werewolf in London in 1980. So it's uh, interesting to think that we are as far from American Werewolf in London as the Wolfman was from American Werewolf in London. Yeah, that is really interesting. But it, honestly, I don't think it's gotten significantly better better than an American werewolf in London or certainly not the howling like you look at the digital stuff from that del Toro wolfman and it's not very good yeah well that's not Rick Baker's choice that that happened the way that it did oh sure yeah 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 I'm not not blaming Rick Baker at all I know he wanted to do it practically and like well, hey I think we can really do this and they were like uh but it w we could also do it with computers um I think that's pretty much what made him quit the business. I think that's why he stopped. Uh, it's interesting that this technique with the cross dissolve where they just add a little hair over time was pretty much the only way you could really do a werewolf transformation or really any transformations for like a really, really long time. 
But in black and white photography, they also have the ability to use various colored lights with special light color reactive makeup that they did some really amazing effects that way just by removing filters on the camera or shining a light at just the right time. And if they would have used that in conjunction with the cross dissolves where they could have put deep lines, they could have probably, you know, painted in like some really dark, deep lines that would react to that light when they brought the light up and then they could start cross dissolving, you know, and just save themselves just a little bit of time. And it, it makes me wonder why they didn't apply that technique other than, Jack Pierce was probably burning Lon Chaney Jr. way too fucking much with that hot iron. Well, and yeah, I mean, it's one of those things of like, it had never been done before. So it's easy to cut, like throw stones at some of the makeup work in this, but Jack Pierce was making all of this up. Nobody else was doing anything like this in the business. And he also didn't use molds. He built this every day yeah. out of kit. He had a few things that he would build ahead of time out of like rigid collagen and cotton and things like that. But he was building these things by hand, sculpting them out of basically different versions of fucking glue and cotton. Yeah, it, it's incredible. Like, it, again, as quaint as this movie is, when you stop for two seconds and think about how none of this existed before this movie, like the idea of what a werewolf transformation ought to look like, what the lore of it was. Like there were other movies that kind of touched on some of this stuff, but not like this, not, not in this kind of, you know, seismic way. And, well, and it's also technological innovations that are leaps and bounds ahead of anything in its contemporary, let alone just what was achievable just a few years ago. Yeah. And it's really interesting that a lot of these innovations tended to stagnate as people got used to the perfection of them at, at their execution for it, because it is an industrial art and you can replicate the same type of results. You know how to make it happen uh, when you're filmmaking. You can, you can basically make the same steps to replicate the thing that you're doing. That's why they make it an industrial art. Mm -hmm the way that it is it has to be otherwise you're not going to achieve your goal to create the film and movie makers nowadays that have all of these amazing techniques and various pieces of equipment even cgi and just the ability to go onto a message board and see how to do these makeups yourself and not just create it out of your own mind and, and just kind of hope that you're going to figure something out like this is literally a guy with a bunch of different types of glue and some various other like objects just trying to figure out a way to make it look like a man walking upright with a wolf face and doing it in like the forties by a cross dissolve, which no one had really done before with the makeup and setting it up and perfecting it and making it become the standard. I mean, you can say it looks quaint now, but you have to realize that the achievement this was is monumental. Yeah. for everything that filmmaking could be and also special effects everything changes with jack pierce for makeup effects and horror films mm -hmm. everything changes there alone and then you start adding in the things that like the other filmmaking techniques and some of the other innovations that this film alone has done and you can say the word quaint because that's how people might view it now just because it's so old to them and old timey and everything but it represents a monumental level of achievement that even with all of the money that Hollywood has now, they fail to be able to create and innovate the way that they did in their history. Yeah. I mean, it was like when Avatar came out and people were like, holy fuck, you can make blue cats jump around on screen and it looks real. Like, that's the same kind of sea change. Or, you know, Jurassic Park when that hit. Like, the Wolfman is the Jurassic Park of its time in terms of, like, Oh, you can do that with movies? Okay, well, that's gonna that's gonna change things then. Um, yeah, it's yeah. It, it, it's truly like historically significant, uh, as well as still fun. Like I, you know, I'm enough of a dumb monster kid that when somebody turns into a wolfman and starts stalking around a, a misty forest, I'm like, go on. Um, and that's what happens here. He turns into a wolfman. And he ends up killing a grave digger. Uh, and but it's that classic shot of like him peeking around the tree to be like, Arr! and uh, he, the one that shows up in a million movies because that's the one that everybody always clips. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. And 
so he kills this grave digger and then the police show up not far behind him and are like oh this guy's got a severed jugular which is the same cause of death as jenny williams the girl who was murdered and also there are these wolf tracks in the door the dirt so maybe larry talbot was right that in, in fact he there was a wolf that he killed and the next morning larry talbot wakes up in bed fully dressed and he sees like oh shit there are dusty wolf prints on the floor and the windowsill and i like this moment where he's got a like he he realizes like oh shit i i don't know what i did but i went off and i did something and i'm immediately going to clean up my mess i actually love that we come in the room tracing those wolf prints and if you pay attention they sort of become almost like a man's feet mm -hmm. towards the very very end by the time he gets to the bed so basically he's transforming back and just passes out into the bed yeah it's it's very cool and when he wakes up he's got a pentagram on his chest uh and the the cops show up uh tracking the wolf prints to the garden below his window and Larry Talbot is like, gulp, uh, what's going on, Pop? And he's like, well, Larry, it turns out that this wolf killed a gravedigger last night, and the police were tracking it, strangely, right up to your window. How can everybody see Claude Rains? It's weird. Yeah, right. It's because uh, he's not wearing all the, uh, uh... The bandages, bandage. right. <laughs> and so they end up going to church for, uh, the morning services, and outside, uh, Gwen and her father, you know, greet him and so forth. And Larry walks into the church and immediately, I mean, it's like Damien going in or something where he's just like, I don't think I should be here. And before the services get started, he takes off, which is another moment I really like of him kind of wrestling with this idea of like, oh, I think I'm probably a murderer and I have no place in a house of worship. Well, it's also that, and he steps in and he's very silent. He doesn't make a noise, but people just sense him. And slowly but surely, one by one, they all turn and look at him. And that sense of feeling very much other and feeling like you're going to do something very awful and you may have already done something really awful. And just all of that at once built up in this scene just tells you everything you need to know about his condition as a werewolf, right? Yeah, yeah. It's... I also wanted to point out the reason I kept saying that they attend the C of E is because this is very clearly a Church of England church. It looks so much like that architecture. They never place the movie. Like, there is some suggestion that it's in Wales. Uh, there have been interviews with the creators who sort of suggested that maybe it's Germany nobody ever really says for sure but yeah it sure feels like it's england is where this is all happening uh, it feels very very english to me and not just because i can't see the lead actor that's playing his dad yeah yeah um okay so larry now is pretty convinced he's a werewolf and he <laughs> as are we yeah and so he tells his dad hey pop i'm a werewolf and he, he, his dad's like, don't be silly, Larry. Let's get the doctor in here. And so he tells the the doctor, like, I think I'm a werewolf. I told Pop, and he doesn't believe me. And the doctor is like, no, no, no. That's a mental disorder. You are not actually turning into a werewolf because that's crazy talk. And meanwhile... This is the sort of thing we put people away for, man. Don't say that. Right. If you weren't rich, we would have you locked up already. <laughs> Right now, you're just eccentric because you're rich, so don't lose that money. Right. Yeah, the second that there's a downturn in the economy, you're you're going to the, the terrible one, the 60 Minutes kind of middle institution. And so what the, we used to call in the business a snake pit. Right. Bedlam, if you will. Uh, <laughs> so we, we also learn at the same time that Andrews and the local cop are setting bear traps out or werewolf traps out uh in the woods 
And so Larry uh, eventually gets fed up with this conversation with his dad and the doctor, and he takes off. And as soon as he walks out the door, the doctor is like, listen, your son is fucking crazy, dude. Uh, he said, The way he puts it is, he's received a shock that has caused a definite psychic maladjustment. You must send him out of this village. And be- again, because they're wealthy, uh, Claude Rains is like, don't be silly. You're talking like a witch doctor. Uh, I think staying here is the best thing for it, Eddie. And so we have set the stage for the conclusion of our movie where the next night Larry uh, is once more wolfed out and is on the prowl. He gets caught by one of these traps and reacts like an animal, like he's trying to pull his way out of it and stuff. It's uh, it's pretty effective. I really like that moment a lot. I kind of was wondering if he was going to start chewing off his own foot if he doesn't break free at some point. Yeah. Um, but as uh, some men are are closing in on him with some dogs uh, and he's trying to escape, Maleva rides up and she's like, oh, you son of a bitch. Um, you didn't put on your, your medallion. So uh, she explains to the wolfman who is in his trap. She's like, I'm here to help. And she essentially helps him out of this trap, but then he runs off and, uh, but has turned back into himself. He's Larry Talbot again and not the, the Wolfman. And, uh, and, and it, I think he changes back because she repeats the, the way you walk is thorny poem again is sort of the magic that she uses, uh, to accomplish this. Yeah, I get the feeling that she is some type of a magic user as well. Um, you, it just really feels like it because maybe she created the charm because she never created it for Bella. <laughs> you know, that could be another route that it could be. Um, and the fact that he didn't use it is really the crux of her doing this spell. She kind of turns him back or gives him like a reprieve. You know, yeah. but they don't really they don't really say it, but it, it feels so heavily implied. I'm glad you grabbed that and saw that too. Yeah, there and also because Larry doesn't have a mother figure in this movie. That Maleva kind of like she is a surrogate mother in the way that that Larry is a surrogate son after the death of Bela. And that's going deep into it, but I, I think there is an element of that at play. Well, there's also a lot of soothing that a mother will offer a child with rage issues that, say, a father is not able to do. And there is some heavily implications that a werewolf is, in fact, just a person with very heavy rage issues that turns into something that they can't control. And I can see where she's used to talking someone down because Bella also suffered from the same affliction. And that's essentially the magic that she does is she finds a way to calm the beast. Mm -hmm. She's literally there with a hand going, hang on, sun's getting real low, big guy. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it's very much that. Uh, (laughs) And yeah, so he runs off instead of sort of accepting her help and runs into a couple of villagers that are like, hey, what are you doing out here with no shoes on and smelling like a wolf? (laughs) <laughs> and also can you pronounce the word w without stammering right. yeah, a word with a letter w in it without stammering uh w- 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 werewolf <laughs> their wolf their castle <laughs> i thought you wanted to talk like that i didn't want to talk like that <laughs> so good uh anyway i was reminded recently that i think it was gene siskel uh, was talking about how, um, I think it was Gene Siskel, Gene Siskel or Roger Ebert one, um, talked about how, uh, there were, there was a movie in the seventies that he pronounced or he declared that was terribly unfunny and that, uh, the jokes were supposed to be set up in punchline, but if they were way too exaggerated like there was too much time between setup and punchline and he said there are other movies that have been uh equally plagued by this and the the examples he cited were blazing saddles and young frankenstein as being only mildly funny and it's like oh gene siskel had a terrible sense of humor that is what i've learned today 
<laughs> yeah, if you can't laugh at those two films, you clearly can't laugh at anything. Yeah, I mean, Young Frankenstein, are you out of your mind? Just uh, by by use of the term Schwanstucke alone, uh, that that is a classic. But anyway, um, that's neither here nor there. So yeah, so Larry uh, gets away from these townspeople, goes into town, and he, and he wakes up Gwen, and he's like, "Hey, uh, I got to get out of here, and I want you to come with me." And she's like, "Okay, I'll I'll come with you." And he's like, "Oh, by the way, I think I killed Bella." And also, I'm pretty sure I killed the grave digger, and I'm I'm afraid I might hurt you too. And she's like, "So why did you come here then?" And he's like, "Uh, forget what I said. Oh, wait a second, you've got a pentagram in your hand. I gotta get the hell out of here." So he leaves her, runs home, and confesses to his father. He's like, "I'm a hundred percent sure that I killed Bela. I'm probably gonna kill Gwen next." And his father is like, "Listen, Letty." It's clear that this Maleva woman has filled your head with all kinds of crazy ideas. And so he ends up tying Larry to a chair at Larry's request. He's like, tie me up, Pop. And not in a kinky way, like a, a safety way. And so they do. And for no good reason, Claude Rains is like, I'll tell you what, Larry. While you're here tied to this chair, I'm going to go help look for this wolf. That'll prove that you're crazy. And so that's exactly what he does. And, ex and, and kind of explains to the doctor, like, here's why I've done this. Maleva uh, confronts him, though. And uh, she's like, well, you don't have to be afraid because you've got that silver tip cane. And so if your werewolf son comes at you, you need to kind of dome him with that. And you're going to be fine. And as they're kind of arguing back and forth, and I kind of like the fact that Maleva is like where she was very sympathetic to Larry. She does not have any sympathy for his father who she, I, I feel like she sees as being unsympathetic and, and completely misunderstanding the situation, uh, which in both cases are true, but it's pretty distinct that, she treats the son very kindly, and she's got no time for the father's bullshit. Um, the only person that she has any sympathy for at all is, like, once people start shooting and they're like, hey, there's a wolf out here again, because apparently, you know, Larry, Larry Talbot turns into a werewolf and is back on the hunt. Um, Gwen shows up, and Maleva tells her, like, no matter what you do, don't run through the woods. And you need to come with me right now. And Gwen's like, I can't. I have to find Larry. And so she runs off. And th at that point, Maleva's like, all right, I'm done with you people. You guys are the stupidest villagers I have run into in some time. And they literally do everything she tells them not to. Right. Listen to Maleva. You're going to be okay. Um, but yeah, so Gwen runs off into the woods and the wolfman... Uh, comes close and is about to attack her. They start struggling. And then Larry's father shows up with his silver cane. They start fighting around. And then Claude Rains goes to town on this wolf man with this uh, silver cane. Beats the ever-living shit out of it. You can see that Dad clearly had some anger issues, too. Absolutely. Because he really taps into that rage. Yeah, and, and again, this is kind of apocryphal, but the story goes that during the filming of this, like, there were some stunt people involved in that kind of thing, but uh, for sure, Claude Rains socked Lon Chaney Jr. with this, this cane hard enough that it bruised his eye, and they had to go, kind of like, all right, we're done for the day. We got we to gotta deal with this. But, but with Claude Brains, you kind of wonder if it wasn't just to put too much passion into using an object that they probably should have made sure it was rubber before handing to him to clobber someone else. Like if perhaps he wanted to make it look too realistic. I don't think it was with malicious intent. As opposed to if Evelyn Ankers was given that, I think she probably would have been doing it out of malicious intent. Right. She was probably like, hey, uh, how about you hand that over? Let me take a couple of swings. Uh, but yeah, so he ends up killing the Wolfman. And Maleva rolls up on him and is like, oh, you dumb sons of bitches. I told you this was going to happen. All right. 
the way you walked was thorny and then she you know uses her her magic poem and then the wolfman transforms back into larry and claude rains looks at the cane and then looks at this body with the sudden understanding of everything he told me was true i have just murdered my own son and uh meanwhile the cop shows up and says oh the wolf must have attacked gwen and larry came to her rescue and ended up being killed by this wolf i'm really sorry about this claude rains and meanwhile clearly he's rich so he couldn't possibly have been the crazy murderer it must have been that wolf right everyone <laughs> um is there money in it if i say yes <clears throat> shut up shut up lord rains will pay you off later let's just move along and yeah in in the movie kind of closes with gwen crying into the arms of her fiance and claude rains looking fucking horrified at what he has just done which again is the wolf real or is it in fact just the beast that lived within that he inherited from his father dun 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 yeah i mean i think that it's pretty explicit in this movie that it's real but i think that's the holdover from the previous script is what i'm getting at is oh, the oh, oh that for stuff. sure yeah 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 yeah, I mean, in the the Larry Gill version of the script is how I heard it referred to. Yeah, then it's, yes, like the father kills the son, and then, you know, the question is, well, what, was he a monster, or was he a monster wearing a man's skin, or, you know. It, it, I, it's a more psychologically interesting movie that way, but it's also, I don't know that it's a better movie. Uh, yeah, that's fair. This is definitely a better movie. I like it just fine this way, where he's very much a monster, and all of that text becomes subtext. Yeah, for sure. So let's. Uh, so that's the the story of the Wolfman, told in only slightly more time than it takes to actually watch the Wolfman. Uh, but let's get into the cast of this uh, movie, which we've touched on some already. Um, but uh, you know, just to to volley the first pitch whatever I, i'm mixing sports metaphors i'm sure um but L lon cheney I jr I know shit about sports ball right so lon cheney jr as lawrence talbot um is he's a really tragic figure i think the thing i like most about this movie when i watch it now is i like seeing the the obvious inner turmoil of his character realizing what he's done and also knowing as we talked about that this is a guy who was dealing with alcoholism he had his own demons with you know the loss of his father and living in his father's shadow and that kind of thing that he was kind of a tortured soul anyway and and that comes across on screen like he i i think he's one of the best things about lon cheney jr is he had a great uh way to emote you know, I, I think that's something he got from his father is that I don't know that his line deliveries are great, but his face says a lot and he's a good physical actor, I think. He conveys a wide range of emotions with just his presence, all in the way that he holds his body, which is probably something he definitely picked up, given that Lon Chaney, his father, was raised by people who were deaf physical expressions of yourself are going to be vital for them to be able to visually see and get an idea of what it is that you're trying to say. So I wouldn't doubt that that body language was handed down because you do tend to learn from your family. And I'm sure that his father may have tapered that back for other folks, but he probably still couldn't help being that expressive with his stances and his motions and his facial structure whenever he would look at someone. He needed to be able to emote that way. It had to have transferred over, right? And I mean, being around actors, because he had to have grown up when his dad was still acting as well, some of that had to transfer over into him. Just even subconsciously, he had to pick some of that up just as a kid at some point in his life. And then you, you add on top of that, the raw talent that obviously would still be something that uh, could be handed down from father to son. We, acting ability it does tend to run in the families like special skills do tend to be a thing there are some families that are more technological 
based like mine. You know, we're a bunch of like autodidact engineers. <laughs> we don't do it right, but we find a way to make it work kind of red green style. And it's in his family too, or for acting is how I'm looking at it. You know, all right. So speaking of that, one of the saddest things about Lon Chaney Jr. is that when he was dying later in life, um, he, his father died uh, of the same thing. It was kind of a mix of a heady blend of uh, alcoholism and throat cancer. And um, at the end of his life, he couldn't speak. And so, much like his father at the end of his life, who also could not speak, both of them had to revert back to using sign language in their final days. And That's an interesting paradigm for both of them. Yeah, that Lon, Lon Chaney learned it from his parents, used it when he was young, used it at his death. Lon Chaney Jr. was taught by his father, used it when he was young, used it at his death. And it's a, a weird cycle um, but it's, yeah, I, 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 I think the story of Lon Chaney Jr. is, is, it's a sad one, but it's also fascinating because he is such a, a, a tortured soul kind of guy. Um, but I, I like his performance a lot. I, I, you know, the other highlights for me are, uh, I think Claude Rains is great. I love Claude Rains. Uh, I will watch Claude Rains in just about anything. And uh, I think he he's great as the, you know, the skeptical father, the kind of voice of reason in this movie. Um, and, like, uh, my favorite performance, I think, is uh, Joseph Payne in Mr. Smith Goes to Washington is perhaps my, my favorite Claude Wayne Rains role. But um, he's just great. He's terrific. And he's great in this. He was an excellent Phantom as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. He was in Casablanca as Louis. I mean, he's obviously the Invisible Man. We'll talk about that later. Um, but, well, not me, but someone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone will talk about it. And, um, yeah, so I think he's terrific. And, you know, the, the Evelyn Anchors, I think, is fine. She's, she doesn't have a ton to do in this movie, so she's very much the damsel in distress. She, she doesn't have a lot of agency. But that's par for the course for these kinds of movies um, you know something that i've also noticed about the particularly universal monster movies as opposed to other films of the similar era is that the dialogue delivery is a lot more straightforward and there's a lot less of the putting on airs that early hollywood acting used to be mm -hmm. um uh, that's around the same time it's like a lot of workman actors that are familiar with the camera because they've been cranking out a bunch of other stuff before they get the shot in this quote unquote drek that it was considered at the time because this was just made for you know cheap scares and they they didn't they didn't respect this stuff when they were making it i mean the filmmakers did but like the studios didn't really like it was still kind of looked down on it was just super popular and so it sold well and they just kept making them it's amazing how horror is looked under such a better light now and it's grown and people oh wait no it hasn't but anyway <laughs> but you know you would have these folks that have done enough work behind the camera and have been able to see what their acting is like so they can hone their ability just by being on camera so much to be better on camera than some of the stage actors that get put into the bigger presentations of the time directly from the stage who seem kind of hammy and over the top. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I would also call out uh, Bela Lugosi and Maria Uspenskaya uh, as kind of the one-two punch of our... Uh, you know, are, are traveling uh, gypsies is how they're referred to in the movies. Romani would be the more enlightened way to say it. Um, yeah, it's kind of a pejorative, although one that some of the folk have taken on. So I'm not one, so I can't use it. You know, like I, I tend to try not to. I try to say travelers or Romani or Roma or, or what have you, or just ask. <laughs> you know, if it's just a group of folks that all travel together or if it means something different. Sure. Like if there's more of a cultural basis for it, you know, um, then you, then use that term. Although it's a legal term in England, so it's going to be really hard to discredit as anything and say that it's a pejorative for sure because 
some places are using it as legal terms still. Yeah, it, it, it's tough. I, I'm with you. I, like, I don't use it in my walking around time. But in a movie like this where, you know, every every time they're referred to, um, it, it tends to be in that manner. It, it's a little tougher to avoid. But, well, uh, and it's it's a racial stereotype of those peoples as well. Let's be frank, but yeah. it is of that time. That's what you would expect. Yeah, and and it you know it presents them as pagan. It presents them as other. Uh, it, it's very similar to the way that you see a lot of Native Americans presented in movies, especially in the sixties and seventies and eighties in in American cinema, where suddenly they're the mystical. Uh, characters that can explain the supernatural happenings or whatever. Um, well, in this case, they're the ones that bring the supernatural into this uh, whitewashed aristocratic uh, village. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> it. Yeah. It, it. It's unfortunate, but it was also you know it's it's the times and. <laughs> Right, it's it's an uncomfortable thing that you have to acknowledge, even though you enjoy the film. Just like the talk of how horrific some of the actual actors you may admire, or in their private lives, you have to compartmentalize that and realize that in the times, this thing was not uh, this type of activity was not all that uncommon, both in the overt racism of some of the writing and with some of the behavior behind this camera and you can either accept that and enjoy the film still or you can't and i feel sorry that you can not enjoy the film because of that because it's still a wonderful film yeah and also it, it is somewhat helped by the fact that maleva is right she's right about everything you know like it, it, again if everyone listened to maleva hashtag maleva's right um everybody would have been fine people would have survived this movie that otherwise ended up fucking dead at least until the inevitable sequels um well and the ability to kill a werewolf with silver becomes extremely dubious the next time the wolfman shows up in the universal series and is the same larry talbot yeah all right we'll briefly touch on that in a minute but uh any anything else about the cast that you want to point out before we move on to uh the the themes of this film no, I think we we kind of nailed like the, at least the main players, and I already made my one Ralph Bellamy joke I have about him being one of the Duke brothers. So I, I guess I'm all out. Excellent. Um, so uh, we and we've touched on some of this, but you know, this movie obviously, and all werewolf stories ultimately are about the dark nature that we all possess that we're afraid of letting come out to play because sometimes that part of ourselves does some shit that we've got to feel guilty and apologize for later um i mean i to me that is the primary theme of any werewolf movie of jekyll and hyde any movie where you are through no fault of your own you are put in a position where you are doing something that you would not normally do you know uh that can be a metaphor for the alcoholism that Lon Chaney Jr. was battling. It can be like rage issues that, you know, we've talked about. Uh, I'm raising my hand, but no one out there can see it. Like that's where I definitely, definitely found a kinship with what Larry Talbot suffers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, we, we all have that battle. And I think th the psychology of this movie is very much about that. Um, and there, there's also the idea, not, not to get away from that entirely, um, but there's also the idea that you have to wait for someone to die to get what you want. You know, uh, for Lon Chaney Jr., it was kind of waiting for his father to die and assuming his name. For Larry Talbot, it's his older brother, as we discussed. And there is this sense of, like, the inheritance that you didn't, the inheritance you wanted and didn't think you were going to get. And then it happens for the worst possible reasons. And, and that's one of the reasons, like if this movie didn't have an honest to goodness wolf man, and it was purely, you know, left to the imagination as to whether or not Larry Talbot or Larry Gill in that version of the script was, um, an actual werewolf, or if he was just psychologically damaged, then I think you could make the argument like, oh, well, you know, he's inheriting this estate. 
but it's through the death of his older brother and that's left him unhinged. Um, but there's some interesting family shit in this movie, both with the brother, with his father, who, you know, is a bit cold with him, but, you know, they have conversations about how maybe this is an opportunity for them to be a little less standoffish with one another, uh, with Maleva as this kind of mother character. Like, there is some some meat on that bone in terms of uh, where Larry sees himself in the world because he's, you know, he was a guy who was sent away and then comes back and he's a stranger wherever he goes. The other interesting aspect of that is what we're talking about. There's an idea of inheritance, you know, or, or waiting around for someone to die and having things passed on, you know, that goes through the family. And I think I, I touched on it earlier, and I think this is a perfect opportunity to kind of bring it up here. But also, I believe that the Wolfman being an allegory for the rage issues and the fact that the way that the father so vehemently starts beating on the thing, even after it's down and it's definitely probably already dead, continues to strike it to the point where in 1941, you're wondering, how did they get this past the ratings board? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it becomes quite violent. I mean, for its era, obviously. It doesn't seem that violent now, but it definitely is for its era. And I made the the, the reference that there's some rage issues. And there's, a, there's moments where the way that Claude Rains plays this character, you feel like he is holding back from ripping into people because he raises his voice for a moment, but then he always gets that aristocratic composure where he's like, I mustn't allow the plebs to see me in that state. They must see that I am fit to be where I am kind of mm -hmm. kind of deal. And he holds that back. And, I, I, and it's also hinted at that, like, there was some great animosity. There was some great anger. There was something that was enough to where as a child, Lon Chaney's character was sent away something happened that the father was needing to be away from him so much that he literally sent him to America to live to where he doesn't even have the same accent. Yeah. He is, he is a complete stranger. He does not belong in this world. And now this world is sort of being thrust upon him and he's seeing a lot of who he is echoed in his father. Well, Claude Rains, character obviously physically looks nothing like Lon Chaney Jr. The thing that these two do so well is they match energy. And you can feel the tension between the two of them when they're discussing some of these things. There is guilt, there is remorse, there are things that they have done that they regret how they have treated each other. And they don't even feel like father and son and they barely even, they feel more like strangers. They barely even recognize each other. And they play off each other that way where a lot of what Claude Rains' decisions are later in the movie, especially when it's like, no nonsense, Larry needs to stay here. It's obviously where he's like, I've already lost one son. And I have driven this one away to where I don't even recognize him. I can't lose him now. Like you, you it's, it's played out on his face when he's doing that. Mm -hmm. And the inheritance in this case happens to be those rage issues because there are moments where even they're talking and he's trying to express anything emotion wise. And Claude Rains just looks like he's really holding something back and very reserved. And it feels like anger to me anyway. And especially whenever he is trying to defend his son, he is quick to a very lot of like an outburst to try and cut things off and stop people. Not so much in the defense, just more in just his overreaction to the situation, you know, because they're just implying, well, if it was a wolf, you know, why is, why is this cane here? And he just immediately cuts them off. It's like nonsense that Larry wouldn't, you know, hurt Bella or something like that. Like he just jumps to that immediately. And it's, it's a very, angry way that he does it. So I feel that there are themes of that where it's being handed down and there is that inheritance. And because of how dour even Maria Uspenskaya's character is, did she create Bella? She make him the quote unquote wolf man that he is, if we're going to look at that psychologically, because she seems to have a lot of anger issues just because she never seems to ever fucking smile. And the minute you see her face, it's like a dementor. She sucks all the joy out of you. Yeah, yeah. Well, like I said, you know, catcher's mid. Um Right, right. So I like that idea, and I like that this thing that this monster that they are struggling with, if it is the rage that's in there, the older folks have finally either gotten old enough to where they don't have the hormones that kick that stuff in enough to where they can actually act on the rage, 
or they've learned to control it so that they don't stop their heart from adrenaline spikes at too young of an age because yeah. they made it to ripe old age. Somehow they found a way out. But because it's this inherited thing or it's this nurture thing that it runs through the family, both Bella and Lon succumb to that rage and it turns them into an unrecognizable monster that they are then horrified of the actions of what they've done. But it can't be them. It has to be this other thing because there is no way that they, the caring person, when they're not this rage monster, could be like that. And I recognize that even as a little kid, like the first time probably that I watched that because I had seen that anger in me. And I definitely, it runs in my family. It's it, like rage issues and just having disproportionate reactions to uh, external stimuli just to where everything feels like it is so much more of a threat than it actually is in that moment. And you need to react and like rage just builds and builds and builds and just turns into this moment where you explode. And it, it doesn't even have to be like where you just smash a fucking car or, or whatever, like Street Fighter 2 style or some right. shit. Like it just it just explodes and like you just fucking yell at something that isn't even the thing that you're angry about because there's something else that's building in you. And that's when that monster is there. We are like, I'm not even angry about that. Where did that come from? And seeing that as a little kid where I would get angry and I not necessarily I won't want to say like throw a tantrum, but that's what my mother would have called it. But it was literally like I had so much rage that I couldn't control and I didn't know what to do. And I was just like losing it. And, you know, that, like I said, my mother would call it a tantrum, but I just couldn't control my anger. And then seeing the Wolfman and seeing how Lon Chaney Jr.'s character felt the next day after knowing that he hurt someone was like a serious wake up call and made me really kind of realize what that was, you know, and what, what it, what it basically is. It's, it's basically the equivalent of the monster that I thought was living in me as a little kid. Cause I couldn't explain it. And like I said, I felt seen. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, I, I, I'm genuinely impressed when I, when I think about what this movie is capable of sort of saying ab ab about you know humanity uh in the universal sense uh of, of that you know like what you're describing is something that we all deal with to one degree or another maybe not specifically that but it is it is part of the human condition and you know some some horror movies are about guys who are thrown into vats of nuclear waste and turn into superheroes with a mop with a mop and uh and and some movies are about the dark psychology that lives inside us all and you be the judge listeners which is better let me let me throw one more kind of thematic twist at you um and i think this is fr uh from kurt Siodmek, uh himself who said um that the wolfman himself is a bit of a metaphor for the nazis uh, because an otherwise good man turns into a vicious killing animal who knows who his next victim is because there is a symbol of a pentagram or star on them. And so, All right, that's, a, that's a bit of a stretch, but I can see the symbolism there. Yeah, I thought that was a pretty interesting take on it. I was like, all right. I, yeah, I, I mean, it's not something I would have come to on my own. But this was certainly, you know, the rise of Hitler. So the idea of, of someone saying like, oh, if you have this star, that, like the problem with that theory is that the star appears on, on Larry himself. And well, it, yeah, it's supposed to be that you see it on the next victim, but I think the scar is supposed to be representative of the werewolf bite because uh, Paul Nashi does that too, where the werewolf bite actually forms a scar that is a star shape because of how the bite takes place um, with the, the teeth. I don't know exactly how it works out, but I, I guess that's what they were trying to hint at. But yes, he does have the symbol on him, but it was supposed to be the victims because he sees it in Evan Lanker's hand at one point and yeah. he knows that he's going to hurt her next. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, let us then uh, wrap or at least begin to wrap things up here with uh, a look at final thoughts and scores as always uh, we do a five star scale we do allow half stars 
there are no quarter stars because we are not monsters unlike Lawrence Talbot <laughs> um, so uh, sir when you look back at the Wolfman uh, A how, how do you how does it land for you in a modern context and uh, and two uh, on a scale of five how do you rate this thing if I'm going to rate it solely on a modern context of looking at it through the eyes of how far we've come since the days that this film was made and I can see the seams and everything like that for the pure storytelling alone it's still a 4.5 it's just not perfect because all the other things drag it back mm -hmm. but I'm only going to deduct a half a star because it's not their fault I, I, I better look at it that way but from all of the viewings that I have had with this film and because of how much I connect with it and even just ignoring what you asked me to do, I'm still going to give it a five. <laughs> so like either way, it's 4.5 to five. Like this is my absolute favorite universal monster movie. It's my favorite universal monster seconded only with Frankenstein's monster. Well, when we do uh, Universal's daughter, we will uh, we'll continue our discussion of Wolfman movies with you. We'll have to... What, what is the next one? Is it um, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman? Is that the, the I, next one? I believe so, yes. Um, you may want to look at going backwards to uh, Werewolf of London and some of the previous... And She-Wolf of London. Because there were two even before this that were werewolf movies that they did. Yeah, yeah. I I thought about doing one of those, but I was like, eh, th this is really where it, it begins. Right, yeah. Um, well, I mean, Lon Chaney Jr. is where it's at, don't get me wrong, but I just would encourage others to check those out at least for sure yeah so frankenstein meets the wolfman is 43 two years later um so we might we might circle back to that um well and i can i can tell you how that movie alone created an entire wave of werewolf movies that i am completely obsessed with all right i like the sound of that um i will uh i will second a lot of what you've said and also add to that i think there is there's a lot of interesting stuff to talk about as you've heard on on this particular episode uh surrounding this movie whether it's the making of the movie the the actors involved and, and the way that they got along or didn't get along the story of Lon Chaney and Lon Chaney Jr um and and the psychology of the movie like all of those things are fascinating to me this is one of my favorite movies to talk about because it's just chock full of just weird little nooks and crannies of information that I think are, are terrific. Uh, and we've only scratched the surface on the psychology, the history, the various behind-the-scenes drama. I mean, go to the special features and get this on disc. For goodness sakes, you will be rewarded. Oh, man, I've, I've got that Universal Blu-ray set, and it looks so nice. I'm so pleased with, with the look of this thing. I watched it before the show on my projector, using that same blu-ray box set and it was up converted to 4k and i was enamored yeah it, it looks so good yeah I, I, <laughs> one of the reasons uh for doing uh universal even aside from the punnery involved is just so i can kind of live in those discs for a month um and yeah so it's yes if you can pick up that universal monsters blu-ray you should it's terrific it, they look good there's lots of great special features it's a really a, a really well done package um so that being said i'm gonna give this movie a solid four and a half as well um it is a movie that i i have a lot of time for um i think it is you know like i said it's like it, it's like complaining about uh uh, something like night of the living dead not being modern it's like well maybe not but everything that we know about modern werewolf movies started with this movie you know it is it is the the forerunner of everything that i like about werewolf films and i like a lot about werewolf films so uh yeah i love this movie i think it's terrific i think uh, and and a lot lots to chew on like it's a movie that once once we finish this conversation I will probably have a further conversation with my lady friend about this movie just so I can sound smart um, because it's fun to talk about all the the intricacies and filming and themes and all that stuff so 
Um, and my therapist and I will have a good time discussing how I came to those conclusions while watching the film this time. Yeah. Hey, look. If you it, honestly you want to impress your therapist, you start off with like I was watching The Wolfman, and it really opened up a lot about my own anger issues. Um, and they're gonna love that. <laughs> All right, I can score points. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Um. So. Uh, that brings us, Court, to the end of the show, which is three things you may or may not know about the Wolfman. Um, some of these... I hope it's May. <laughs> <laughs> some of these we have uh, discussed already, so apologies, but it, it, you know, I get excited about no one's stuff. Here's a thing that we didn't talk about. Um, there was a scene in the script in which the Wolfman was going to fight a bear that was in the uh, the camp, but unfortunately, the bear ran away. <laughs> oh, but, I'm so glad you held on to this until now. But if you look at the trailers, the original trailers for the Wolfman, you can see scenes where the Wolfman is fighting a bear. So, uh, that's a delight. Um, all right. Uh, there, there are, as we talked about, a lot of modern myths that, that began with this film and with writer Kurt Siodmak. So, uh, here are the things that this movie invented. Just to put a fine point on this. Uh, a person becomes a werewolf through getting a bite from a werewolf. That comes from this. The only way to kill a werewolf is uh, silver. Uh, werewolves and their victims having pentagrams. That is something that um, carried on, not just in this series, but in werewolf uh, myths writ large. Um, there is also, uh, going back um, to the original werewolf lore, you could become a werewolf by making a pact with the devil. In the original werewolf lore, you could turn into a werewolf at any time, night or day. And but uh, but the downside of that, like as great as it sounds, like oh, I could just turn into a werewolf whenever I want, like Teen Wolf. The problem <laughs> the problem with that is that you can be killed by anything. Yeah, it doesn't take a silver bullet to to take care of you. And then so the later movies uh, in this series would also add things like. Oh, you're you're immortal if you're a werewolf and aren't killed properly, which is how they bring back Larry Talbot in the in the sequels. Um, so Yeah, you have to have like your heart pierced and then some rules like uh, other folks that run with these come up with even more ridiculous rules where it has to be someone who loves you. Yeah. That, that kills you with the silver thing and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's the American werewolf in London, like, oh, I think somebody who, who loves you has to do has to do this. I'm um, referencing a Paul Nashy movie, that's why. Oh, okay. So, so it was... Yeah, because he's the one... That, that was Paul Nashy who added that stuff. Oh. I, uh, I love stuff like that. Anyway, <laughs> I, I like it when a filmmaker is like, yes, but what if this? Um, and, and just changes the game. So, the final thing you may not know about The Wolfman, uh, there was a scene in which Evelyn Anchors uh, had to uh, faint and fall into the set... Uh, the outdoor set with the mist and the trees and all that. The the fumes from this fake fog they were using were so strong that she passed out. But the director, George Wagner, and the rest of the crew were working on some other part of the scene and didn't notice. And so it wasn't until way later that they started to tear down the set for the night that one of the technicians was like, hey, anybody uh, notice that there's a lady over here? I don't want to look a gift horse in the mouth or nothing, but, you know, she's kind of unconscious, and that's not good. Yeah. Uh, so those are things you may not know about the Wolfman. Hopefully, uh, dear listeners, you have learned a lot that you may not know about the Wolfman and Lon Chaney and Lon Chaney Jr. and the history of werewolf movies and all kinds of stuff. It's one of the great things about talking about these uh, these universal movies is that we get to go back to the beginning and and talk about how all this stuff, all the stuff that we love 
it all kind of springs from uh, a lot of these Universal movies, and uh, I, I adore it. So before we get out of here, though, before I fully cut you loose, Court, tell the the kind people at home where they can hear more out of you. The easiest place to find me, everyone should know this that knows my voice, legionpodcast.com forward slash cinema dash psyops dash podcast. That's the main landing or launching page from which I exist. I'm on Facebook as Court Psyops. I am off the Twitter. I have kicked that habit at least. I keep on Facebook because that's where pretty much all my listeners keep on contact with me in that group. And of all of the tumbleweeds that are spinning all through of that <laughs> particular social media, our Facebook group is actually one of the most active ones, particularly for a podcast. And I am so grateful for that. Yeah, yeah. You get you get a lot of action over there. I'm here. Here's uh, my my role here with the social media is uh, I check in about once a day at this point, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, whatever it is. Um, it, I'm about a once a day where I like I bomb in I see what what messages are out there every now and again I'll kind of scan through some stuff and throw some likes around and then I'm out you know like I, I hit it like SEAL Team 6 <laughs> I, yeah I, I tend to keep in contact with people on there and keep conversations going um, basically in comment sections um, about movies and things like that uh, pretty much keeping it in the groups and that's the best place to be mm -hmm. um, stay off the main feed check into that maybe once twice a day for news related stuff because I follow Reuters and all those other places for the articles there yeah I'm trying to drag everybody over to discord with me is what I'm trying to do where I'm just like no 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 that's I, I guarantee you I will see you there because that's what I have open for work all the time um, so uh, the the Discord's been a little bit snappier lately because I've been forcibly trying to like tell people like no 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 if you want to just talk about random shit with me that is the place to do it. Um, anyway, this ain't about my therapy. This is about everybody's therapy. Uh, <laughs> so uh, anyway, thank you again. As always, you're the best. I love it when you're when you're here. And uh, we will do this again soon. And for the rest of you knuckleheads listening, I'll be right back to close the show. And there you have it. That is my conversation with Court. Uh, thanks again to Court Psyops for showing up. Be sure you're checking out Cinema Psyops uh, right here on legionpodcasts.com uh, for more out of him. Uh, the If you aren't familiar with that show and had heard us say clip, then that comes from Cinema PsyOps. You should listen uh, to that just so you get that joke. And I guarantee you, uh, you will, after one episode, uh, you will absolutely get uh, that that inside joke, as well as uh, a, a genuine appreciation for Court and what he does. He runs a tight ship over there. Uh, he and Matt both. That is the Wolfman. We are going to be uh, turning our attention away from Wolfman. And to Invisible Men uh, on the next episode. That's right. We are talking about The Invisible Man with Derek Bourgeois, uh, a movie that I dearly love. Uh, if you've never seen the original Invisible Man, you now have your homework. Go watch the original Invisible Man with Claude Rains. It is terrific. It is a fantastic movie. And uh, we, we have a good time talking about it. So uh, that is coming next week. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, as I mentioned in the upfront, if you want to uh, chit chat about your own universal movies, uh, we're going to be doing, um, a, a fair number of these movies. Cause there's five weeks in June as it, as it happens, uh, five Wednesdays in June. So you'll be getting five episodes this month, but, uh, next month I'll tell you right now, we're going to be talking about, uh, monster dogs. So if you have a movie <laughs> that you want to hear us talk about, uh, involving monstrous dogs uh, and don't worry Devil Dog Hound from Hell already on the list don't even worry about it but uh, if you want to uh, pitch an idea uh, then you can reach me at uh, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash dark parade uh, that is where the, the Facebook group is if you are still on Facebook or meta or whatever it is they're calling it these days uh, you can also hit me up on Twitter which is at dark parade pod uh, over on that social network. And I gotta tell you, I'm kind of a check-in once a day 
Facebook and Twitter user. Uh, I don't really enjoy social media. As I've often said on this show, I, there are very few times that I've spent any length of, uh, of my, my day on social media and came away thinking I was better for the experience. So, uh, I, I tend to, like I said, I check in. I, if you leave me a message there, I will absolutely get it. Uh, but I don't linger. However, if you go to legionpodcasts.com forward slash the dash dark dash parade, uh, you can find links to all the old episodes as well as a link to the discord server. And I'm kind of watching that all the time. I, I use discord for work as well as some other things. And so if you want to hit me up there, you absolutely can. I, I'm on discord a bunch. That is the, the, all the ways that you can get in touch with me. Uh, obviously we have a lot more universal stuff coming up. We theoretically, there was a heart of horror coming on, on Friday, assuming that we can get, uh, our schedules arranged. Um, so we'll see, I think so, but you know, Kate's, Kate's busy and, uh, she has a child and, and children get sick. Uh, and they, yeah, they throw tantrums and not, I'm not saying that Kate's kid was throwing tantrums. I'm saying they do. I can tell you that from experience. And, and so sometimes when we have a scheduled recording, it gets bumped because kids be kids. So, uh, we're, we're working on getting that rescheduled, which means we're probably going to have two hearts of horror this month. Yeah. So we've got that. We've got invisible man next week, more, uh, what you watching coming more heart of horror, more found footage, fool, all that stuff. Episode Wednesday, episode Friday, every week, uh, here on the dark parade. Uh, thank you again for supporting the show. Uh, for sharing it around, as uh, I often say, a, a line that I've lifted from uh, a much more talented podcaster. If you enjoy the show, tell anyone you can, any way you can. Uh, share it around, word of mouth, you know, uh, letters with them letters clipped out of magazines like a psychopath. Any of that stuff works. And hit me up on any of those social media feeds. Uh, I really appreciate all the input. I appreciate the questions. I appreciate uh, the the suggestions for for movies to discuss. And as always, I'm still um, you know looking around always for other people to drag on to the dark parade to talk about these movies. So if you have a host or you are a host uh, that would like to join me, then uh, shoot me a line at one of those places as well. Uh, I think that is going to do it. For this episode on The Wolfman, uh, a surprisingly long... Le well, it shouldn't surprise anybody. Me and Court get together and we yammer on about Wolfman and whatnot. Uh, but a, a pretty meaty episode this week. So I uh, hope you enjoyed it. And as always, everyone, thank you so much for joining the Dark Parade. We'll see you very soon. Mm -hmm.